America in Another World by Ron the Black Cat Chapter 21 To the Capital 0930 January 12, 2020 C 0845 Mid Hour Start 12 196 A The Eastern Plains of the Mock Imperium We will continue advancing towards the enemy capital tomorrow although we will be closer to the brigade this time. That was a large number of enemies. After telling his crew, Nick looks down from his commander's hatch at the turret of their Abrams. There are some scorch marks from the fire that it had sustained. God bless depleted uranium. I wonder why they even put it into the armor, Brian asks curiously. Probably because it works as armor. An American soldier who knows how to speak Latin is currently talking with what appears to be the most highly ranked of the Machians. After a bit of talking, the surrendering Machians seem to be thankful for some reason. Furious walks while carrying Mercator on his back. Mercator had been treated by the medic and is somewhat fine now. Of course, he can't walk and probably still requires more treatment but that didn't really matter to Furious. At least Mercator is still alive. Now, what are we going to do at this point? You can't even walk anymore. The Mock Imperium is done for. Well, you can say that again. There weren't even more than 20 enemy tanks. They decimated an entire division backed with hundreds of tanks in less than an hour by themselves. There's nothing we can do against that. I'm just going to go home. What about you? Where did you live anyways? In the capital. Huh. Oh yeah, you told me about that. Well, that's not going to be a good place to stay during this time. You don't have any close relatives, right? Yep. Why don't you come over to where I live and stay for a bit? We have space. You might even be able to attend my sister's wedding. Mercator chuckles a bit. Do you even know how we are going to get there? It's hundreds of miles from here. How about we borrow a car? Again? Furious? No. We are not stealing. Oh come on. Then you got any better ideas? You can't walk with that bad of an injury and I'm definitely not carrying you all the way there. Actually I need to get you to an actual doctor first. Let's go find the nearest town then. Not on this road. I'm afraid the Americans will find us. 0940 January 12, 2020 C. Tampa, Florida. General, here's the report from the first major battle. General Thompson reviews the report that had been handed to him by his aide. Excellent, this is a guaranteed victory. Hell, we may even come out with zero casualties. That's not something you hear every day. 1520 January 12, 2020 CE. 1140, late hour, start 12, 196 AE. Anisium Castle, Mach Imperium. The 6th Army Division had been destroyed in a battle in the Eastern Plains. Emperor Indistro slams his fist on the table. What is left of the 6th Division? From what reports we could gather, not much. An optimistic estimate would be around 2,000 infantry and 50 or so tanks. Do we know the enemy numbers? No more than 20 tanks. 20. Even we didn't believe it at first but all the survivors we could get a report from had claimed less than 20 tanks. Again, the emperor slams his fist on the table but this time with more force. He looks up and shakes a finger towards his commander that is in charge of the front against the Americans. I know what you are trying to do. You just don't want to make yourselves look bad by losing to the enemy. Um, what? Your Majesty. Silence. After a short burst of anger, the Emperor then goes a bit quiet. You can't possibly lose if we send entire armies from the Magasian front to yours. The commander in charge of the front against the Magasians stands up in an instant from his chair. Your Majesty? We can't possibly do that? 
The moment that front is gone, the Magasians will flood in and we will be faced with a two-front war. The Emperor glares at him. Don't you see? If we don't do anything, the capital will fall into enemy hands. But what will we do if the Magasians attack? Then only half of the forces from the Mach Magus front will be sent to the front against the Americans. Have the forces? That's ridiculous. If we have the forces, we won't have enough men to sufficiently guard the entire front. We will be abandoning the eastern half of the Mach Magus front. That part is not important anymore with the Americans closing in on our capital. The Emperor then turns towards the commander in charge of the front against the Americans. In a stern and slow voice, the Emperor commands him. That should be more than half a million soldiers supported by hundreds of tanks. Use these soldiers and tanks as you see fit. Stop the Americans at whatever cost. If you don't, the Emperor stops there while staring at him ominously. Understood, Your Majesty. 2320 January 12th, 2020 CE, 0340, early hour, start 13th, 196 AE, Mach Magus Front. In the eastern portion of the Mach Magus Front, Magasian soldiers peek out from their trenches after noticing the silence on the other side. To their surprise, there is no sign of life from the Machian side. Unknown to them, the Machian had secretly retreated yesterday night in the cover of the dark. 0020 January 13, 2020 CE. 0310, early hour, start 13th, 196 AE. In the throne room of the Emperor of Magus Imperium. When the news of the retreat of Machian soldiers from the eastern Mach Magus front last night reached Emperor Arstand, he immediately called for a meeting to ask Caius again to begin the offensive. Your Majesty, with the withdrawal of Machian soldiers on the eastern front, we shall begin the offensive. Finally, we could have begun much earlier but you just had to wait. Your Majesty, it is better to wait to have a perfect plan. Even if it takes years to develop, a perfect plan will guarantee success. What does having a perfect plan have anything to do with this situation? That is a piece of common knowledge in war strategy. It basically means be patient in war. It is never a good idea in a war to take the initiative. Always wait for the enemy to act. Now that the enemy is acting, we can take advantage of it. Emperor R stands size. Igenus, just begin the offensive. 0140 January 13th, 2020 CE. 0450, early hour, start 13th, 196 AE. Mach Magus front. Across the eastern Magasian trench line, Magasian officers blow their whistles to signal the beginning of the offensive. Magasian soldiers crest the trench lines whilst accompanied by their Magi tanks. Magi tanks are tanks with special engines. Magi tank engines accept both normal fuel and mana given to them by a person. Of course, fuel has an advantage seeing that the mana pool of an average person isn't that big. On the other hand, if a great Magus is the person fueling the tank, then the tank can run for a longer time than using fuel. However, great maguses would never be in the position of a lowly soldier because they are extremely valuable. Some of the Magasian infantry are carrying guns while some are not. The ones that are carrying guns have an average amount of mana. The ones that aren't are the ones that have enough mana to use the elements as weapons. The Machian soldiers and their Magi tanks quickly approach the opposing trench without taking any fire. The Magasians slide into the enemy trench to find it completely deserted. The Machians have finally left after 35 years. It felt strange. For 35 years, the Machians and them have been sitting across from each other just waiting for the other to strike. Now just in one night, their enemies left. After a few minutes, 
An officer among them yells while blowing his whistle. Don't stop. Continue men. It's time to take back the land that was ours in the first place. Charge. Yayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
The garrison consists of an infantry regiment of 1,000 men and 30 old tanks retired from the main army. Commander, the enemies are nearing? They have stopped not far from here, sir. Chapter 22, End of an Imperium 0102 January 17, 2020 CE 0435, Early Hour, Start 17, 196 A. Anisium Castle, Mock Imperium. The commander of the front against the Americans is giving Emperor Industros a report of the situation. Your Majesty, the garrison forces at Industropolis have reported sightings of the enemy army. This early? Are those the 20 tanks that defeated the 6th? No, Your Majesty. It's a much larger force. It seems to consist of many tanks and other vehicles. How far away are the reinforcements? Because the railways were bummed by the enemy, they are still many days away. What about the Air Corps? Can't they do something? Anything? No, sir. Don't you remember? Nearly our entire remaining aircraft were shot out of the sky when you ordered an aerial all-out assault of the enemy landing forces. The garrison can hold right. It's questionable. I think we will have to RETR. Questionable? The garrison has to hold. It's my city. But your ma, tell me the garrison will hold. But. No buts. The garrison has to hold. If it doesn't, your heads are going off. Understood. Now tell me, will the garrison hold? Um, yes, your majesty, the garrison will hold. 0320 January 17th, 2020 CE. 0540, early hour, start 17th, 196 AE. Outskirts of Industropolis. The garrison soldiers of Industropolis sit in their hastily dug trenches waiting for the enemy. One of the soldiers hears something like a plane in the sky. He looks up and sees a weird-looking plane coming towards the ground. Hmm? What's that? Dirt flies into the air in arcs as bullets hit the ground in a straight line. Soldiers in that line are cut apart. Tanks fare no better as the bullets penetrate their thinly armored top. The crews inside suffer a similar fate to the soldiers outside. BRRRRRRRRRTTT. A few miles from the outskirts of Industropolis. An A-10 Warthog flies overhead after unleashing a hail of bullets from its 30mm GAU-8 Avenger rotary cannon upon the Mackian trenches. Ah, music to my ears. Seems like the Air Force will soften them up a bit before we go in. Quite nice of the Machians to build their defenses away from the civilians. The 2nd Marine Division and 1st Armored Division waits on the far outskirts of the city for the Air Force to finish laying waste to the Machian defenses. After the initial few days of the aerial campaign, the Air Force had quickly run out of targets on the ground. With the Machian garrison in Industropolis setting up an easily seen trench outside of the city, it is a perfect target for bombings. Industropolis. Sounds of loud explosions from the defenses can be heard throughout the city. In a small, run-down apartment, a child walks up to her mother. Mother, we will be fine. Right. Everything will be all right, dear. There's nothing to worry about. Contrary to her words, there is a tone of uncertainty. Quite a lot of Industropolitans had fled the city after the palace was destroyed. Those that had stayed were the ones who didn't have relatives outside of the city, were poor, or believed that their country will be victorious in the end. Just recently, news had broke that the Americans, the enemy, had landed on the eastern beaches. Aurelia Quatrua and her ten-year-old son, Procius, were too poor to be able to leave the city. Aurelia's husband, Galerius, had died a few years ago to illness leaving her alone to raise their child. A week ago, the remaining residents had witnessed the soldiers of the Industropolis garrison going towards the outskirts of the city and setting up defenses. 
It was clear that the enemy was near. Now the explosions from the defenses signaled the start of the enemy's attack. 0320 January 17, 2020 CE. 0540, early hour, start 17, 196 AE. The explosions outside of the city stop as abruptly as it had begun. Did we win, mother? Can I go out now? I want to play with other children. I'm sure we did. But stay in just in case. But ma, Aurelia is smiling but there is worry underneath it. 0220 January 17, 2020 CE. 0510, early hour, start 17, 196 AE. Anisium Castle, Mock Imperium. Military officers including the commanders of the two fronts look at each grimly in the meeting room of the Anicum Castle. I don't think the capital will hold. With the Americans already assaulting the capital and our reinforcements still days away, it's impossible. We aren't going to win, are we? Looking at the speed of the American advance, we will have to pull back our troops all the way here. The military officials trace a line with his finger on the map. That's giving up half of the country. Even if we give up half of the country, will we even be able to push them back? Our air corps are all but destroyed. Even if we had any spare planes, they would be shot out of the sky within mere minutes. From what our reports indicate, it is highly possible that American aerial weapons greatly outrange ours. Moreover, from observation, their aircraft are much faster than ours. There's nothing our aircraft can do against theirs. How is that even possible? They could be using magic but there is no known magic that can do that. Besides, hundreds of our tanks can't even fight back against just 10 of theirs. From what survivors of the 6th are saying, Hundreds of rounds from the Industro is and IIS don't even leave a scratch on the enemy tanks. On the other hand, the enemy tanks can destroy ours in just one shot. We have to surrender. The Emperor will not agree. We may even be executed for trying to tell him to surrender. He has gone insane. There's nothing we can do. A short silence fills the room. There's only one way out of this isn't there. Regretfully so, the commander in charge of the front against the Americans grabs a pistol. Less than ten minutes later, Emperor Indistros enters the meeting room after being called there by a messenger of the commander of the front against the Americans. What is it? I hope this is good news. The garrison has repelled the Americans. Your Majesty. Multiple military officials grab the Emperor. What is the meaning of this? Unhand me. Your Majesty, please stop resisting. I am the Emperor of this country. You dare attack me? Guards. Two guards enter the room. The commander pulls out his pistol and places it at the Emperor's head. The Emperor's eyes widened in fear. If you don't want the Emperor to die, do as we say. Drop your weapons. The guards part of a company of infantry that has sworn absolute loyalty to the emperor and follow him everywhere, immediately drop their weapons. They have also sworn to protect the emperor at all costs. The emperor starts to be enraged. Fools. Wise decision. Now get out of the room. If we detect any attempts at rescuing the emperor, he will die. The commander of the front against the Americans turns back to the Emperor after the guards quickly exit and close the door. Your Majesty, we have lost the war. We will be announcing our surrender to the Americans soon. This is treason? Treason? You won't get away with this? My guards will be back. You will regret this. At this point, the Emperor was just spitting out random threats. Gag him. Hey? Wamafu Fofumafu. 0320 January 17, 2020 CE. 0540, early hour, start 17, 196 AE. Outskirts of Industropolis. 
The second Marines and first armored start moving into the city. The outskirt defenses are dotted with craters and destroyed tanks. The civilians that had come to view the battle quickly went back into their homes. A few minutes later, Industropolis. A convoy of Abrams enters the city and heads directly towards the bombed palace. The convoy passes many houses that have civilians peeking out. The streets are empty. A few miles into the city, a lone figure walks towards the convoy. The convoy comes to a stop. A Mackian soldier holding a white flag in the air advances down the street towards the lead Abrams. The tank commander of the lead Abrams gets on his radio. I am a messenger of the garrison commander of Industropolis. We are offering our surrender. Furthermore, our commander has received a report that our country is willing to negotiate. Humvees, Bradleys, and Abrams enter the city after the surrender. The streets are empty since civilians are still wary of going outside. Aurelia and her son, Prociulus, look out of the window of their apartment. Down on the streets, sand-colored vehicles appear in a straight line. Mother, look, what are those? Sergeant, you really should get back in the tank. There's nothing to worry about, Brian. I just want to look around. I heard that the Machians are surrendering now. Hmm. This kind of seems like Manhattan except with older architecture. The commander hatch is open and Nick is taking a gander at the 20th century style city. Anisium Castle, Mock Imperium. Was this the right choice? Surrendering to the Americans. Amafafamamomafu. What else? Surrender to the Magus? They aren't going to let us off. We are hoping that the Americans treat us better than the Magus. Millimeter MMM. But what if they don't? NMNMMMFFFMM. There's nothing we can do at this point. We still have to announce our surrender to the Magusians. However, the Americans will hopefully dictate most of the terms seeing that they captured Industropolis. We lost and that's that. The military officials are having a conversation in the meeting room amidst the emperor screaming through a piece of cloth that was stuffed in his mouth. The emperor was tied up, gagged, and placed in a chair in the corner of the room. Western Mach Magus Front the artillery on the western Mach Magus front fell silent as an order of ceasefire was given on the Machian side. The Mach had telegraphed a surrender and asked for negotiations. 0742 January 17, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. President Hayes had eaten breakfast and was getting to his office. An aide runs up to him. Mr. President, great news. What is it? The Machian capital has fallen and they are opening up for negotiations. Mission accomplished then. I need to get on the phone to Thompson. You have made your country proud. Looking at the report that was just given to me. These are excellent results. Minor casualties. No vehicles lost. Perfect. Turns out that Machian military officials performed a coup d'etat and arrested the emperor. Mock Imperium. News spread throughout the Mock Imperium about the surrender of their country. Many are in despair and fear over the loss of their country to the Americans. However, more fear of what would happen if the Americans decided to allow the Magusians to dictate the terms. They know that the Magusians would be extremely harsh to them. Near the town of Ixxa. Pomponia sits on a chair in her house while drinking her afternoon tea. During her trip to town, she had heard of the news of the surrender of her country but she didn't care one bit. She wondered about how her father was doing. That old man got what was coming to him. I hope this won't concern me. She thinks of this while stirring her tea. Chapter 23 Part 1 New Threats 1859 January 17, 2020 CE. Nashville, Tennessee. Jack flops down onto his couch after another day of work at his office. 
He grabs the remote and flicks on the TV just in time for the 7 o'clock news. This comes just a few months after the victory against the BAME Kingdom. In both conflicts, American forces have taken supposedly zero casualties. In his address to the nation, President Hayes claims that this war is one of the most successful wars ever fought in American history. However, with the memory of the Iraq War still fresh, many Americans are doubtful that this is the true end to the war. Jack quickly gets bored and switches the channel to look for other more interesting shows. Life doesn't feel much different from before, except for the decrease in a variety of produce and some minor problems early on like a decrease in manufactured products. Not much change was felt. A ridiculous thing is that some are calling the fact that the United States was transported to another world a hoax, claiming that it is a government conspiracy to cut Americans off from the rest of the world. They believe that the government employed a special technology to do so and that current events are being made up. 0110 January 25, 2020 CE. 0335, early hour, star 25th, 196 AE. Agent Port, BAME Kingdom. A sand-colored vehicle moves down a busy BAME street. Some BAMES gaze at the vehicle for a little while before reverting back to what they were doing. They were interested in what a car or a horseless carriage as it is commonly called by the BAME, looked like. A few months ago, a lot of people would come out just to watch the cars pass by. However, now, most have gotten used to the cars that conduct patrols to keep order. In a bar on that busy street, Two men look out the window to see the American vehicle pass through. I can see why we lost. They are on the same level as the Machians. Maybe even better. News has been going around that the Machians have been defeated. Is that so? Well, either way, our kingdom stood no chance. At least they seem more helpful than the Machians. And hey, they don't seem to be forcing us to fight their wars or anything. I can't believe I'm saying this but the future may brighter than before. Yep. I heard from one of my friends who works in hospitals that the Americans are giving us some technology that would really improve our lives. The Machians would never do something like that. They only gave us the bare minimum and even demanded tribute. It has been many months since the invasion of BAME conducted by the Americans. Not much on the surface has changed. A distant relative of the king has been placed into power by the Americans. To the general populace, the new king seems to be merely another puppet under another powerful nation. However, there are good signs, the Americans seem to be willing to help with the development of BAME, unlike the Machians who gave them just bones. Medical technology and methods have been shared. Improvements in agriculture and infrastructure have also been provided. The Americans also seem to be interested in trades for food products and some of the raw resources that BAME has. 0826 January 25, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. Mr. President, the goodwill operations in the BAME are going great. The populace doesn't seem to be hostile to our forces. Chief of Staff John Wills is giving President Hay a brief report about the current situation after winning the war. That's good to hear. What about the mock? Negotiations have gone quite well. The Machian military officials are willing to surrender to our terms, which includes us occupying their country for a couple of years, having a government under our supervision, and constructing military bases on their land. They haven't demanded much. They seem to like the fact that we aren't enslaving them or demanding any payment or tribute from them. However, they do seem adamant about keeping their government mostly the same. President Hayes smiles lightly at that report. That's great. Almost too good to be true. We do have two minor problems. The smile instantly drops from his face. Oh boy, why did I say that? First of all, 
it seems that the Machian Emperor has decided to abdicate. In this circumstance, we would have had one of his children take over but they are too young to take the throne. Are there any relatives that can take the throne? Well, the military officials did tell us that the Machian Emperor had an illegitimate adult daughter that is living near the town of Ixxa. We could probably place her on the throne. Although we do have to find here first. That doesn't seem to be much of a problem. What's the other issue then? The Magus is demanding a stretch of territory on the border. About 200 miles deep into the Machian territory from the Magus. The Magus claims that it was land that they had lost in the Fourth Mach Magus War that occurred 35 years ago when the Mach invaded them. Do the Machians say it's true? Yep. Are they willing to let it go? Nope. President Hay sighs to that answer. God damn it. It's never easy. The Magus is threatening to declare war on us over that stretch of land. What are the negatives of giving them that land? Other than losing that piece of land to build military bases on, not much. Although the Machians are somewhat threatening to null the progress we have made in negotiations, it's obvious that they are just bluffing. They have no more power to actually confront us again. Then just give the Magus that stretch of land. I'm not sending innocent Americans to die fighting for another country's land. Especially after that country tried to attack us. That should be all then. Oh wait, there are two other things. What? First, from the Department of Defense. What do they want? Ah, uh, John flips through the folder he is holding. Well, first of all, they are recommending that we repaint the desert camouflage that we have on our ground vehicles. Why? Well, studying the satellite images, we have found that this world greatly lacks deserts. There are only a couple of small deserts around this world. Thus, we will have to repaint our vehicles. I see. The Dodd is also recommending some adjustments on hardware acquisition. What adjustments? Since we don't have any peer adversaries to worry about anymore, acquisition of stealth fighters and bombers aren't that important. They are not recommending us to stop. Just to reduce the pace. We will still continue development just in case we ever get transported back to Earth. On the other hand, the acquisition of non-stealth aircraft is highly recommended since they are more suitable for current operations. For example, F-15Xs. That seems reasonable. What's the second thing? The second thing is about the private sector. Hmm. Some companies are expressing interest in the BAME Kingdom and Mach Imperium. They see the New World countries as a lucrative market and a possible place for cheap labor. Originally they were wary of expanding out because of the lack of protection. However, with our occupation of the BAME and Mach Imperium, that issue is gone. I see, well, as of right now, let's take some time to stabilize the BAME and Mach Imperium before opening the floodgates for these companies. Chapter 23 Part 2 New Threats? 1025 January 27, 2020 CE. 0912 Start 27, 196 AE. Town of Savaria. Furious knocks on the door of his family's house. Who is? I hope I didn't miss the wedding. Big Brother. Tears form on the eyes of Furious's little sister as she hugs him. We thought you died. Furious smiles. Your older brother won't die that easily. Inside the house, an older woman looks from a room. F. Furious. I'm home, mother. Furious's mother slowly walks to him for an embrace. I knew you were alive. I'm just glad to be home. Mercator, who is behind Furious and is standing using crutches, coughs to get his attention. Ah, uh, oh yeah. This is a friend I made in the army, he's Mercator. Is it okay if he lives with us for a bit? His home is in Industropolis and it isn't really a good time for him to go back. Of course, 
I'm going to call your father. He's working in the fields. We are having a celebration tonight. A few minutes later, Mercator, Furious, and Furious's family is at the dinner table. Son, ever since we got news that the Americans have landed and that your unit had been wiped out, we were extremely worried. Well, we were lucky and barely escaped. What exactly happened? Well, you guys have read the letter I sent you correct? Yes. Well, Mercator and I got stationed at. Through dinner, Furious and Mercator recounts their experience of the war. We were able to get a ride from this nice guy who has a sister near Bertie. 0027 January 30th, 2020 CE. 0454 start 30th, 196 AE. Near the town of Ixxa. A knock came on her door. Who is it? Pomponia slowly walks to her door confused. Usually no one would come to her house seeing that it is secluded. Recently, she had feared that the Americans would barge in during the invasion but that never happened. Even more surprising was that she heard that the Americans didn't even pillage Industropolis when they arrived and won. Usually a victorious army would pillage and plunder a defended city. Pomponia opens her door slightly and looks out. A man is there looking down at her. Nice to meet you, I am a diplomat from the United States of America. Are you Pomponia Industros? March 12, 2020 CE. Start 42nd, 196 AE. Crowds line the streets for miles. Confetti rains down from houses. Long columns of soldiers with bayonets shining from their Magi rifles march in formation. Behind them, Magi trucks pull Magi artillery and light, medium, and heavy Magi panzers motor along. Squadrons of Magi planes fly overhead. The infantrymen are singing to their National Army marching song. Our glorious army marches on human land and sings this glorious song. A rifleman stands on humans' shores and silently hums along. Up and down we move forward. And the whole world may curse us or hail us. Whatever they choose to do. Wherever we are, let's go forwards. And we shall laugh like this. Ha 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 ha. We're fighting for elves. We're fighting for our leader. We'll give the humans no rest. Wherever we are, let's go forwards. And we shall laugh like this. Ha 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 ha. We're fighting for elves. We're fighting for our leader. We'll give the humans no rest. We are prepared to fight in many battles. To the north, south, east, and west. And now we stand ready to fight against the human plague. Our glorious army will never rest. We will destroy all humans, so that no one will disturb our good fortune. And when our ranks are thinned, for us there will be no retreat. Wherever we are, let's go forwards. And we shall laugh like this. Ha 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 ha. We're fighting for elves. We're fighting for our leader. We'll give the humans no rest. Wherever we are, let's go forwards. And we shall laugh like this. Ha 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 ha. We're fighting for elves. We're fighting for our leader. We'll give the humans no rest. On a balcony of a palace overlooking a street where soldiers are marching through, a young and tall person stands looking proudly at this display of strength. My leader, the great Magus's death is nearing. The doctors are saying that he will die within the month. Send him my regards. He has done his duty for all elves. Finalize the preparations for surfacing. Chapter 24 Part 1 Blitzkrieg 0834 January 31, 2020 CE Washington, D.C. In the Oval Office, President Hayes is receiving his morning briefing. Overall, the negotiations have gone quite smoothly with the Mackeyan military officials. They have agreed, although quite bitterly, to hand over the territory that the Magus lost 35 years ago. We also have found the illegitimate daughter of the Emperor. Although she is refusing, 
Our diplomat is saying that it is likely she could be convinced. Now, the main issue is our further operations in the Baim Kingdom and Mach Imperium. We will have to garrison forces and construct bases in order to cement our control. We will also have to be wary of possible dissent and other factors. About two months later. 1020 March 21, 2020 CE. President Hayes is in a meeting with his senior staff when a knock disturbs it. Mr. President? Urgent. What? Our satellite found a continent surfacing to the south of the Magus Imperium. The president questions it as if he had lost his hearing. Hmm? Surfacing. It's coming out of the ocean. A confused face forms on the president. What? 0104 March 21, 2020 CE. 0332 Start 51, 196 AE. Of Valen, Elven Nation, Elven Continent. Terran Van Harris views the scene in front of him. Hundreds of ships are preparing in the main port. Hundreds of Magi Panzers motor down the road beside him. As this is happening, the air bubble held up by the Great Magus for nearly 150 years slowly disappears from top to bottom. The water that was kept for the port in the air bubble meets the water of the oceans. The Great Magus has truly served his and his father's nation. Even now, the disappearing air bubble and the resurfacing of the continent is only possible because of the Great Magus. Terran reminisces of the time when his father was still alive and the Great Magus wasn't near death. One of his greatest memories was when he, his father, and the Great Magus entered the royal palace with their army and overthrew the weakling king who had submitted to the humans. If only the Great Magus's health wasn't bad, they could have immediately started an offensive against the humans. The power of the Great Magus was unmatched but his health required him to need extreme care. Even with powers to raise and lower small continents, he would have died from his illness if he went into battle. Now it was up to him to accomplish his father's dream. Terran looks up towards the sky and mumbles. Dear father, once I'm finished, there will not be even one single human left on this planet. I shall cleanse it of all its filth and inferior species. 0414 March 21, 2020 CE. 0507 Start 51, 196 AE. Western Beaches of the Magus Imperium. It is a bright and sunny day on the Western Coastal Defense Line, a line of naval fortifications and trenches stretching from one end of the western beaches of the Magus Imperium to the western end of the Magus Mach border. It has been about two months since the defeat of the Mach Imperium. Although still active, the number of soldiers on the Western Coastal Defense Line is slowly being reduced. With no foreseeable threat in the near future because of the Magus defeat and their non-aggression pact with the United States of America, the Magus Imperium has decided not to waste so many resources and manpower on the coastal defenses. In the highest and one of the few still manned naval fortifications, a soldier lazily scans the horizon looking for ships. He sweeps his binoculars from west to east before quickly moving back to a spot that he had just passed. Sir, a rather large ship has appeared over the horizon. Were the Navy conducting exercises? Hmm? I didn't get any reports of our Navy conducting any exercises here. Could it be a merchant ship? Can't be. It looks like a battleship. It's turning to its broadside. Give me the binoculars. The commander of the naval fortification grabs the binoculars out of the soldiers' hands. After looking through the binoculars for a bit, the commander screams out in alarm. It's huge. It, it's turning its gun towards us. Enemy. Man the gun. Man, it. Contact the other fortifications. A few minutes later, it is too late. While still loading the naval gun, a massive blast destroys the naval fortification. 
The surviving and still manned naval fortifications desperately try to elevate their gun to target the massive battleship. A few minutes earlier, the pride of the elven nation and a beast made of steel, the NN, National Navy, Van Harris aims at the coast with its 838 cm cannons. Created to lead the elven war machine and to rule the waves, it is being used at the start to demonstrate the might of the elven nation. Show these humans true war? Fire. The eight cannons blast an entire salvo towards the fortifications. Within minutes, eight 1,764 pound armor piercing shells detonate across the targeted portion of the western coastal defense line. For the next 10 minutes, the guns on the NN Van Harris continue firing salvos in intervals towards the naval fortifications. A few more minutes later, hundreds of landing craft and supporting warships appear from behind the battleship speeding towards the beaches. These landing crafts, designed by the top engineers of the Elven Nation, are able to carry four heavy Magipanzer weighing 50 tons each hundreds of miles on the seas. Today they are carrying a mixture of infantry, Magi Panzers, Magi Trucks, Magi Artillery, and other vehicles. On other sectors of the western beaches of the Magus Imperium, similar events play out. 0426 March 21, 2020 CE. 0513 Start 51, 196 A. Abelinum. People bustle around in the streets of one of the biggest cities in the northwestern region of the Magus Imperium. Two months ago, the city had one of the biggest celebrations in its history. People celebrated fervently to the news of the Machian defeat. From the formation of the Magus Imperium, the Machian Imperium had always been a threat and an arch nemesis. Magusian schools had always taught their students that the Machians were vicious demons aiming to destroy the Magus Imperium. For most of the lives of the common Magusian citizen, the threat of invasion from the Mach Imperium was always there. When the news had spread about the Machian defeat and occupation, everyone became hysterical. Of course, it was disappointing that it wasn't caused by their own hands but it was still a victory nonetheless. Now, with everything back to normal and the mess from the celebration cleaned up, people had quickly returned to their daily lives. In one of the busy main streets of the city, people entered and exited stores and cars snailed their way through the congested road. All of a sudden, hundreds of terrifying screeching sounds proliferate through the air. People look up towards the sky to witness aircraft diving towards them. In an instance, the bustling city shatters. Numerous large explosions go off and screams of horror can be heard throughout the city as men, women, and children scramble for cover. Cars screech to a stop in the middle of the streets as their occupants run away. The people who were once strolling calmly through the streets are either running into buildings or crouching down. In the air, hundreds of Magi dive bombers, RA-189S designed by the Ralner Aircrafts and Motor Works in 189A, dive towards the city to unleash their payload. Thousands of 550 pounds bombs and 50 pounds bombs rain down onto the city, indiscriminately killing anyone in its blast radius. Many minutes pass before the explosions and screeching come to a stop. A devastated city is left behind. Fires rage and buildings crumble. Chapter 24 Part 2 Blitzkrieg 0510 March 21, 2020 CE 0535 Start 51, 196 A Baya Air Base Funding for the Air Corps had gone down a bit because of the peace. Unlike the coastal defense lines, the Air Corps must always be ready and on alert. For the coastal defense lines, all you had to do was send a bunch of recruits to man it within a few days. The Air Corps was different. They needed to have experienced pilots who were able to control and tend the wyverns and to continue to train new pilots and wyverns. 
However, the airbase's activity is at an all-time low. With their traditional arch-nemesis defeated, there isn't much to worry about anymore. So, it came as a surprise when reports of air attacks and orders commanding all units to take to the sky came flooding in. Although the pilots are confused about the reports and distress messages, wyverns start running down the runway to take to the sky. Within a few minutes, hundreds are flying west. They have orders to intercept enemy aircraft flying over Magasian land. Less than 30 minutes later, airspace over the western region of the Mach Imperium. A large formation of aircraft is in their sights. It looks as if it is a swarm of bees. Although very similar to Machian planes with a propeller at its front, these only have one pair of wings and look much sleeker. While the Magasian wyverns close in the distance, the enemy aircraft breaks formation. It is obvious that they had noticed the wyverns coming. Some start climbs while others turn. Before long, the enemy aircraft start plunging towards the formation of wyverns. An elven magi fighter squadron commander, Major Erlen Norna, notices the large formation of wyverns approaching them. Through his magitransmitter, which uses mana, the magical particles in the air, to send voices to others, he calls out to his squadron. Wyverns manned by humans to our left? Prepare to engage. His Magi fighter, the EA-192, a fighter designed by Elven Air in 192 AE, has engines and machine guns powered by a Magi battery. As long as the Magi battery doesn't run out of mana, the bullets will not stop and the engine will continue running. Erlen pulls his plane up and turns left before beginning a dive. As he and his fighter wing get closer to the human's wyverns, Erlen lines up a plane in his sights. He presses the button to fire. The elven aircraft have fired first. Tracer magi bullets whiz towards the wyverns, hitting and cutting down many. As the two sides fly even closer to each other, the wyverns start to throw fireballs towards the aircraft. Some are able to dodge them while others that are hit with fireballs burst into flames. Erlen jerks his plane hard to the right to avoid one aimed at him. He then quickly turns and gets onto the tail of an enemy. An intense air battle rages in the sky as wyverns and aircraft crisscross each other. The maneuverability and speed of the EA-192 greatly outmatch the wyverns. The wyverns take time to charge up their fireballs while the magi fighters just gun them down with endless magi bullets. The Magi fighters easily get onto the tail of wyverns and dispatch them within a few shots. However, the wyverns do sometimes get some lucky hits with their fireballs in this chaos of battle. Although taking some casualties, the Magi fighters emerge victoriously. Erlen gets onto the radio. Good work, fellows. Seems like these inferiors are using even more inferior creatures to fight their battles. My Magi battery is running low, we are returning to base for now. 0538 March 21st, 2020 CE. 0549 Start 51st, 196 AE. Western Beaches of the Magus Imperium. The 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division makes its way across the beach. A division made up mainly of light magi panzers and magi trucks carrying soldiers, they are one of the many Blitzpanzer Corps in charge of spearheading the attack. Although they are focused on speed, they also have medium magi panzers as support against well armored opponents. The Elven High Command has decided to unleash a new type of warfare upon the feeble humans. Blitzkrieg. Chapter 25. The storm has arrived. It is another calm day for Lieutenant Colonel Leonid Primus. Even before the Machian surrender, the area that the 151st Infantry Regiment, the regiment that he is a part of, is in is quite peaceful. In his officer room, he has the company commanders of the four companies in his battalion, Captain Proclus Vocula, 
Captain Alas Sevso, Captain Lars Curio, and Captain Agrippa Minervalis with him. They are drinking a little while playing cards. Alas and Proclus are conversing. Alas slaps down a card. I wonder if we can go back home earlier. Proclus places down half of his cards. Ha! Huh? As if. We have been stationed here for ages. It's not like just because the mock is gone that we don't have to be here. Lars joins in on the conversation after seeing that none of his cards can be used. Well if we have to go home that means we can't have times like these with each other anymore. It feels relaxing just to sit back and play some cards with you guys. Leonid counters both the conversation and the cards. It does get boring around here though. All the captains throw their cards on the table. Curio thinks a bit about what Leonid said. Hmm, then how about we go out to town for some fun during one of our free times? Let's go to that bar again. My treat. Leonid nods. I. Sounds good. Another round. Although Leonid is two ranks higher, he and his company commanders have been great friends for a long time. Even now with one of them having a higher rank, they converse like when they were all second lieutenants. 0624 March 21st, 2020 CE. 0612 Start 51st, 196 AE. Primopolis, Magus Imperium. Emperor Arstant has never felt more relaxed in his life. It is as if all the stress is gone. Constant worry about the mock Imperium had aged him. Now with two months of no enemies to worry about, he is starting to look more youthful. The even better news is the American activity in his country. American companies are interested in opening stores and factories inside the Magus Imperium and trade deals are being formed. There is also the possibility of American help in improving infrastructure. Originally American officials were also interested in magic but for some reason lost interest after some observation. When they were asked why they just said that the magic seemed interesting but wasn't of much use to them. To the emperor, it is a shame because if the Americans had more interest, the Magus Imperium could have exchanged their magic information for American military technology. The Americans are keeping a tight lid on anything that could help them militarily. He is currently drinking some tea in his office while looking out the window. Your Majesty? Your Majesty. Arstant grumbles at excessive knocking on his door before responding. Hmm? No need to shout. With the mock gone, I have never felt better. Come in. What is it? One of his servants burst through the door. Invasion. Invis. Hmm? Invasion? Have the Americans broken their pact? No, we are being invaded by an unidentified enemy to the north. To the north? Where exactly? Reports are stating of air attacks on Abilinum. There's also spotty reports of possible enemy landings on the western beaches. What's the situation? Have our forces engaged? Is the Western Coastal Defense Line holding out? We have been trying to establish contact with the units at the Western Coastal Defense Line but they haven't responded. Our Air Corps should currently be engaging the enemy aircraft. Results are as of yet unknown. Get advisor Chaos. A few minutes later. Emperor Arstant is in a military office with military advisor Chaos and a few other generals. Military advisor Chaos is explaining the current war plan to the Emperor. Your Majesty, we are sending the first army towards the Western Coastal Defense Line. Besides, commands are being sent to any units on the other side of the Verona River to also go there. There they will prepare to push them back to the sea. Someone knocks on the door to the military office. Military advisor Chaos looks up from the map and replies to the knock. Enter. A soldier enters and salutes. Report? The wyvern squadrons that we have sent to engage the enemy air units are being considered as lost. Also, 
We have established contact with some units on the Western Coastal Defense Line. They have reported that other sectors of the defense line had come under heavy naval bombardment and that enemy troops have already landed and established a beachhead. We are also getting reports of possible enemy advance past the defense line. Chaos, this plan won't work. The defense line already fell. Chaos ponders a bit and starts moving pieces that represent positions of units on the map before responding. Hmm, then the first army will be creating a position on the Verona River and are ordered to hold them off until we can fully mobilize and send more. Once the fourth army arrives on the river, we can then make plans for a counterattack. The emperor looks onto the map that is placed on the large table in the middle of the military office. The map depicts the entirety of the Magus Imperium and the current positions of armies, divisions, and independent regiments. What about the units stationed and active on the other side of the Verona River and are we just going to abandon Avalinum? The units will be given orders to retreat and set up various positions on the Verona. The surviving civilians of Avalinum will be evacuated. We probably can't hold the city so we should just give way and let them through. 0228 March 22nd, 2020 CE. 0414 Start 52nd, 196 AE. Northern part of the Magus Imperium, from the US view, it's the southern parts. Magi Anzers and the Magi trucks of the 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division make headway towards their target city of Anbalinum. Resistance has been light because of their successful surprise attack. They blasted through any enemy units in their way and hastily crossed and ignored many towns in order to hold on to the advantage of the surprise attack. Those towns can be dealt with by the Elven Army Corps behind them. Less than a few miles in front, men of the 151st Infantry Regiment march down the road on their way to Anbalinum. For some reason, orders have been given for a hasty retreat behind the Verona and to evacuate any remaining civilians in the town they were in and in the towns they came across. Most civilians and military alike are confused. Who could be the enemy? Did some Machian units flee after their country's surrender and are coming to attack? A few minutes later, the 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division crests a hill. The commander of the first tank that got on the hill gets on his Magi radio. Seems to be in the hundreds. The commander of the 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division, Lt. Gen. Ara Balra, opens her commander hatch and views the humans with her binoculars after her tank also pulls up to the hill. She had been a major general in command of a Magi Panzer division but got promoted to lieutenant general. She is still in command of a division but this division was special given that it had more independence. Although a lieutenant general, she had decided to be at the front of her division's assault. Despite the protests she got from her subordinates and staff, she got her way. She didn't even agree to their suggestion of switching to one of the medium tanks. She replies with her Magi radio. A Magi radio is specifically designed to use mana to send signals across the air to other Magi radios. There also seems to be civilians among them. All Magi panzers on the hill, fire at will. Her tank and the ones beside her on the hill, all stallion light Magi Panzers, aka Blitzpanzers, open up with their 20mm main guns. The Magi Panzers are powered by a Magi engine that only uses mana as fuel. Unlike the hybrid that the Magus uses, the Elven Magi Panzers using only mana are more efficient. The main cannons on the Magi Panzer are Magi cannons capable of using very dense mana as ammunition. This allows flexibility since mana can be formed into both high explosive and armor piercing. Some have thought of implementing a ground barrier around the Magi Panzers and other vehicles, but that was seen as impossible. It is only possible using the new Great Magus, who had five times the mana of a normal Elven. The last great Magus, 
the one who submerged and raised the continent, had ten times the mana of a normal elven. Elves with the mana like the last great magus only come a couple thousand years. Elven scientists experimented with trying to make a large barrier by making many elves with average mana activate their barrier spell at the same time. This resulted in multiple small barriers forming around the elves themselves. Some even tried experimenting with the Magi batteries seeing that it's able to use mana given to it by multiple people. The Magi batteries were only able to produce power and nothing too complicated. Combining complex magic seems to be a far-off prospect. Furthermore, with a ground barrier up, you can't see nor fire at the enemy. Explosions occur on the humans below the hill and the human formation descends into chaos. Major General Balra gets onto her radio again. Charge? Run them over. The smoke is clearing from the explosions that just occurred. Body parts are lying everywhere in the area of the explosion. Screams can be heard. Lieutenant Colonel Leonid was flung to the ground from the explosion. He raises his head from the ground and looks towards an area where a group of civilians, mostly families, were. He had just been talking to them and was waving goodbye to them as he walked away so he could go back to his unit. Some he had known personally because they lived near where his regiment was positioned. Looking there, he only finds charred and ripped apart bodies. Tanks? Enemy tanks. Hearing that, Leonid shakes his head and gets onto his feet. Spending a few seconds to reorient himself, he starts to shout out commands to the surviving men of his battalion. Although his ears are still ringing a bit and he is feeling a bit uneven, he still has a job to do. Get the civilians out? Quickly? Go. In the panicked chaos, other officers are issuing orders at random with no coordination. The enemy tanks are charging. Stand your ground and return fire. Return fire? Return fire. Unlike Leonid's orders, most of the other orders are telling them to stand firm. It didn't seem like they understood that they were facing tanks. Sure, there are some in the infantry regiment who are maguses with probably enough power to destroy a tank but there aren't enough of them. Civilians and some soldiers are running. The soldiers that are braver stand firm. Leonid gives a hand to a civilian who was flung onto the ground. Get out of here. Although disorganized, some of the 151st Infantry Regiment return fire with their rifles or magic. They hit but are unable to penetrate the armor of the enemy tanks. Keep firing. It's no use. Most of the others in the 151st Infantry Regiment are in chaos and are fleeing. Leonid desperately tries to keep his men together while also directing civilians. Quickly. 2nd Battalion? Get to the forests? Help any civilians. Leonid quickly tries to find his battalion sergeant major and the company commanders in order to quickly reorganize. Under constant explosions, Leonid navigates to where he had left his battalion. He sees a familiar face crouching and delivering orders to a soldier. Alice? Thank angels I found you. Order your men to retreat and get to the forest. Help the civilians? They are being caught in the crossfire. Tell this order to the other company commanders. Chapter 26, War Crimes Machine guns from the tanks can be heard as they start to get within range. The remaining formations of infantrymen of the 151st Infantry Regiment that had returned fire melted as they either got torn apart or started fleeing. The tanks mercilessly crash into a group of stragglers and crush them under their tracks. Era looks out of the viewports of her commander's hatch. The enemy is in complete chaos while her tanks maintain formation charging. Her tank had just run over an inferior who was idiotic enough to try to destroy her tank with a mere bolt-action rifle. Blood now definitely covers the front tracks and hull of her tank. Driver, turn right, 
I see a group of humans. Run them over. At this point, Era didn't even bother shooting at them seeing that it is a waste of ammunition. Her tank speeds up to the right with the intent of crushing the fleeing and clearly unarmed civilians. Women and children among them. They crunch under the tracks of her tank. 0250 March 22nd, 2020 CE. 0425 start 52nd, 196 AE. Town of Serpai. A battalion from the 50th Elven Infantry Division of the 16th Elven Army Corp enters their first human town. Many things had been dropped on the ground as the humans fled to their homes when the Elvens entered. The battalion surveys the town and orders his subordinates to order their men to begin cleaning up. The platoon commanders order their men as the battalion spreads out throughout the town. Round up all the humans. The soldiers kick down or smash the doors to the houses and force the occupants out at either gunpoint or dragging them out. Quickly. Quickly? Round them up in that area. Don't let any escape. The battalion commander had designated an area where they will all be placed first. The humans complain as they are being pushed around by the soldiers. Some of the human children are crying. Hey, what are you doing? Watch it. One of the humans notices the ears of the soldiers. They're elvins. A few of the humans look up to see the pointy, long ears that symbolize an elf. Some humans try to resist using magic but are gunned down before they could do much. Some also try to form barriers to protect themselves but are blown up with grenades and shot to pieces. Less than 10 minutes later, after clearing all the houses and thoroughly combing the town for anyone who was hiding, the battalion commander issues new orders to his subordinates after taking an estimate of the number of humans. Put them all into those four houses over there. You know what we were ordered to do. He points to a group of houses next to each other in the outer parts of town. Regardless of age and gender, humans are all shoved into the houses. The doors are closed and secured. A couple of platoon commanders were in charge of the next stops. Get the flamethrower team and the machine gunners. Yes sir. Before long, the flamethrower teams are in front of the houses and the machine gunners have set up their machine guns behind them. The machine guns are loaded with magi bullets. Light the houses on fire. Machine guns, don't open fire until ordered so. The flamethrowers douse the house in fire by using their mana to conjure up flames and step back behind the machine gunners. Many screams can be heard from the houses as their occupants roast alive. There's a fire. Open the door. Let us out. Let us out. The humans in the house pound the door. Wait for it. Wait for it. A couple of seconds later, a few flaming and screaming figures burst out of the house. One seems to be as small as a child. Fire. The machine gunners opened up on the people outside before spreading out their machine gun fire on the house. Before long, the screaming dies down. Check around the houses. Make sure none of the filth survived. A few soldiers circle the house to see if any humans were able to get out. The fires of the houses still burn brightly as smoke rises into the air. An officer kicks one of the bodies of those who ran out. It is charred black and blood is running out of where the human was shot. Some humans are not charred like the others but had blood all over them. They were the few who had survived the fire by using water magic to protect themselves only to get gunned down in the end. A few minutes later, the car of the regimental commander comes into town. The battalion commander salutes as a person exits the car. At ease. I see you have finished here Lieutenant Colonel. Major General, did we really have to kill them all? Weren't there orders to keep some of them as slaves? Lieutenant Colonel Volmer, these are orders from the division commander. Leave none alive for now. We are still following the orders of the leader by taking slaves later. And besides, 
There are enough of these vermin running around to make slaves. We can kill as many as we like. Volmer gets closer to the Major General and lowers his voice a bit. I know but, you know, one of the women looked quite nice if you know what I mean. The Major General smirks. You can get a couple of slaves in the future but there's another way for you to have fun. Pick one next town and have a go at it then. You can kill them after the fun. There weren't orders not to do this so it's fine. Across the Western Mach Imperium, Humans living in towns experience a similar fate. 0510 March 22nd, 2020 CE. 0535 Start 52nd, 196 AE. Alfarian, Elven Nation, Elven Continent. Terran walks into a room where all his senior military staff are. The staff all stand at attention and salute by slapping their fists to their hearts when they notice him. Hail Van Harris. Terran didn't really like the salute and greeting but it was something that his late father liked so he decided to keep it. How is the invasion going? His top army general, Konal Leona, responds. Exceedingly well, my leader. Although the Empire is a bit better armed and developed than expected, we have crushed their weak coastal defenses, we have air superiority, and the first Blitzpanzer Corps will be converging on the main human city of this area in about three or four days. Our main force will arrive in the city within a week. So far our units have only found and engaged with disorganized retreating human units. We are expecting the humans to retreat behind this river. The first Blitzpanzer Corps will take the city before quickly continuing on to secure the bridge. Won't the humans blow up the bridge? That's why the first Blitzpanzer Corps will take it before they can. What if they blow it up before we can? We have engineers that can quickly build a pontoon bridge if needed. Good. Our further plans haven't changed, correct? Yes, my leader. Our main forces, the Central Army made up of two infantry corps, one Magipanzer corps, and one Blitzpanzer corps will be centered at the city. Western Army and Eastern Army will each be made up of two infantry corps and one Magipanzer division. The Central Army will be the main push. The Western and Eastern Armies are to make the humans spread their forces thin. Good. How about the one against the kingdoms? The kingdoms are a joke. They have developed nothing and our forces are easily crushing any opposition. The Cyberg kingdom will be defeated in a couple of days. There wasn't even any need to deploy one of our aircraft carriers there. The kingdoms that the elves are referring to are the kingdoms on the Soena continent. The elves have placed top priority at defeating the Empire and sent most of their forces there because they suspected the Empire would be much more advanced than the kingdoms. They are right. Even with their measly force at the kingdoms, they are crushing them. 1023 March 22, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. President Hay is in the Oval Office discussing the recent continent rising out of the ocean. So they are Elvins. Well if the legends are true then they are. Well, they did just rise out of the ocean out of nowhere. We are also getting reports of a massive Elven invasion underway against the Magus Imperium. Did the Magus Imperium provoke them? Doesn't seem like it. The Elvins attacked less than one day after they rose out of the ocean. Might be past hate or something. Hmm. How is their invasion going? From what we could get, the Elvins seem to be successful and are pushing back the Magus. Then we will have to evacuate any Americans currently in the Magus then. Better send that warning out soon. That's for certain. So what do we know about the Elvins anyway? Well they disappeared around 50 A, 150 years ago, and were a bit more advanced than humans of this world were at that time. Do we know their current technological capabilities? Our recon satellites have taken some images and we currently classify them as a World War II nation. 
Seeing that they seem to have World War II technological capabilities, we fear they might have already developed a nuclear bomb. However, we still need to study the images more in order for us to form a more solid conclusion on their actual level of technology. I think we should try to establish diplomatic contact and figure out why they are at war with the Magus. Wait, wouldn't this also implicate us if it was past hate? When did the original empire break apart into the Magus and Mach? Around 80 A. Oh great, won't that mean the Elvins might attack the Mach? If they still think that the old empire is still an entity, then most likely yes. We must establish diplomatic contact as soon as possible. 1020 March 22nd, 2020 CE. 0810 start 52nd, 196 A. Near the town of Imana. The sky behind them is black with smoke from the fire spreading across the town they had just exited. Elven soldiers of the 16th Infantry Division march down the road towards their next target. Looking down the road towards the elves and the burning town behind them makes the Elven Infantry Division seem like an army from hell. 1032 March 22nd, 2020 CE 0816 start 52nd, 196 A. Northern part of the Magus Imperium. Leonid guides his battalion through the forest. With the surviving members of his battalion are other survivors, both military and civilian, of the tank attack on the 151st Infantry Regiment. He has with him about 323 soldiers which in a unit size perspective is around two companies of men. 300 soldiers were from the four companies in his battalion. Less than half of his original battalion's 800. Both Leonid's battalion sergeant major and executive officer, who is a major, did not survive. The other 23 were from either the 1st battalion or the 3rd. The amount of survivors is a dismal number. The 151st Infantry Regiment had at least 3,000 men. Leonid's heart felt heavy because he had lost one of his company commanders, Captain Lars Curio. Lars was a very close friend to him and the other company commanders. Leonid's feelings are obvious and all his sighs before looking at him. We will avenge him, Leonid. Don't you worry about that? Leonid looks down at the soil of the forest. That bastard, how could he just die on us? They are now making haste towards the city of Abelinum. With their shortcut through the forest, they should arrive within two days. Hopefully, the enemy tanks won't get there by then. March 26, 2020 CE. Start 56, 196 AE. Near Abelinum. Out of the three Elven Blitzpanzer divisions in the first Elven Blitzpanzer Corps, hers, the 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division, is the closest to the human city. Era is currently looking at the human city from miles away. Chapter 27, The 300. 0520 March 26, 2020 CE. 0540 Start 56, 196 A. Abelinum. Evacuations of civilians are still underway in Abelinum when scouts came back with the report of enemy tanks approaching. It is estimated with their speeds that they will arrive in a few hours. The civilians who lived in the city had already been evacuated but the ones from nearby towns and further away who came to Abelinum for protection have not yet been. Colonel Kuiso Donatus looks at his map. We need to hold them back for a day. If we don't, we can't get all the civilians over the bridge before the enemy tanks get to the bridge. Regimental Sergeant Major Apius Volumnius, his assistant, comments on it. If we leave any military units behind to hold them back, they will not be able to return. We are planning to blow that bridge up. It's the only bridge that crosses the Verona River for miles around here. Because of how long the bridges have to be in order to cross this section of the Verona River, 
There are very few bridges in this area. They were extremely lucky that the enemies hadn't sent any bombers to destroy the bridge. It might be because the enemy either wanted to use it or that their bombers didn't have the range. The bridge across the Verona was about 20 miles behind them. That's even more reason to leave a military unit behind. If we don't, they will take the bridge before we are even able to blow it up. Can't they just circumnavigate the city to take the bridge? The mountainous terrain around the city is not suitable for tanks. They will have to go through this valley to get to the bridge. 0823 March 26, 2020 CE. 0711 Start 56, 196 AE. Leonid approached Abilinum with his men and the civilian survivors. There are quickly erected barbed wire and sandbags surrounding the road entrances to the city. The city seems to be full of civilians streaming in. A soldier stops them at the entrance. I need to see the commanding officer. Parts of the city had been completely destroyed. Damage can be seen everywhere. Leonid enters an undamaged tavern where the commanding officer had made it into his temporary command center and salutes. Lieutenant Colonel Leonid Primus reporting, I'm the commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 151st Infantry Regiment. Welcome Lieutenant Colonel Primus. I'm Colonel Caeso Donatus, commander of the 52nd Infantry Regiment, the garrison unit of Abilinum. What happened to the commander of the 151st Infantry Regiment? Sir, most of the 151st Infantry Regiment was wiped out when enemy tanks attacked us during our retreat. I have with me a total of 323 men and a couple of hundred civilians. That's all the survivors. Most likely, sir. What's the current situation, sir? Bad. The enemy had moved much faster than we predicted. We had planned to blow up the bridge that crosses the Verona River once my unit passes but now I'm not sure if my unit can leave. If my unit leaves now, the enemy will catch up to us within a few hours. It's even possible for them to secure the bridge before it gets blown up. I had decided to leave behind a force to cover the retreat but my staff and the commanders of my battalions are adamantly against the idea of leaving anyone behind. None of them were willing to stay. Kaiso sighs before continuing. You should prepare to leave too. The earlier we leave the better. My unit will leave with the last of the civilians. We will be doing a fighting retreat. A few minutes later. Captain Proclus Vocula had waited for his lieutenant colonel to return. Leonid, what's the situation? Where's Alice and Agrippa? We need to talk. They are over there sitting on the chairs that they dragged out of the bummed houses. Leonid walks to them with Proclus following. Leonid gets their attention. We need to talk. What is it Leonid? The civilians we guided here are being evacuated correct? Yep and our men are resting in this area. Good to hear. Here's the situation. According to the commanding officer of the Anbalayam garrison, the enemy tanks are extremely close. His subordinates are unwilling to leave anyone behind to cover the retreat. The most likely scenario would be that the Anbalayam garrison will have to defend the civilians against enemy tanks while on the retreat. Here's the thing. I want us to stay behind, to cover the retreat. You don't have to listen to me, it's up to you guys, we probably won't survive. The three captains of Leonid's battalion looked at each other. We are with you, Lieutenant Colonel. It's time to show these bastards what happens when they attack us. For Captain Curio, Leonid smiles and shakes his head. The captains gather all 323 men in order for them to learn of their plans. Leonid stands in front of his men and his eyes sweep from left to right. Leonid starts solemnly. Men of the 151st Infantry Regiment? I know that we are all tired. But we still have a duty to do. There are still innocent civilians who are under threat. 
You saw what happened to them during our retreat? Do you want it to happen again? Do you want innocent women and children to be cut down just because we were too scared to do something about it? Stay with me, with us. Your captains and I have agreed to stay behind and cover the civilians. We will show these invaders what it means to fight the Imperium, what it means to fight the 151st. We are no cowards. We will avenge our fallen brothers of the 151st. Are you with us? Silence falls over the air and Leonid despairs at the fact that maybe no one among his men is brave enough to do this. Then cheers rise. Let's show them. Glory to our Imperium. Lieutenant Colonel we are with you. Of course, not all the soldiers are with them. The 23 soldiers of the other battalions who didn't really know the Lieutenant Colonel didn't want to stay. Leonid let them go. This left him with only 300 men to stop a tank onslaught. I know that we have all agreed to this but is this even possible? I mean there's only 300 of us infantrymen against possible hundreds of enemy tanks. We will just be a road bump. I do have an idea, though I will have to ask the colonel if he has any. The captains look at each other not knowing what Leonid meant. Leonid enters the tavern once more. Didn't I tell you to evacuate? Why are you still here? Sir, my men, and I have decided to stay behind to cover your retreat. Kuso narrows his eyes Lieutenant Colonel Primus, you know that you won't be able to retreat. We are blowing up the only bridge across for miles around here. My men and I know that? We will fight to the end. I have lost a dear friend to those bastards and I won't forgive myself if I just run at this point. Kuso sighs. A lot of artillery pieces of various caliber are being left behind. We were planning to destroy them once my unit starts to leave but your battalion can use them. However, make sure that they are destroyed in the end. Try to retreat after holding out for at least two days. You probably won't be able to reach the bridge in time to find other ways of escaping. Despite what the colonel just said, Leonid understood that retreat is most likely not an option. Especially if the bridges are all destroyed. They would be stuck on this side of the river which will be swarming with enemies within a few days from now. They will hold out in the city for as long as possible. Leonid brightens up. Understood, sir? Thank you, sir. I do have one request though. What is it? Do you have any sticks of Magi Dynamite that I can use? 1016 March 26, 2020 CE. 0808 Start 56, 196 AE. The 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division comes to a stop about half a mile out of the city. There are a couple of houses to their left which indicates that they are on the outskirts of the city. Era observes the city. She can see sandbags and barbed wire piled on the road where the houses become much more grouped together but not a single human soldier. She also sees that part of the city was destroyed from the Air Force's bombings. To her, it seems quiet. Too quiet. Something felt wrong. It didn't make sense. This is supposed to be the human's biggest city in this area if the information from 150 years ago held true. Well, it does look to be true seeing that it definitely is a big city. What didn't make sense was the lack of defenders. It might seem that the inferior humans are cowardly and ran away but something didn't feel right. One of her regiment commanders walks up to her whilst she is staring at the human city. Lieutenant General, what are we stopping for? Send a company of tanks forward first. A few minutes later, a tank company consisting of 15 stallion light tanks on the road approach where the outskirts of the city ends and the actual city begins. Their mission is to drive down the road whilst the rest of the division follows them a couple hundred yards behind. The commanding officer of the company radios the platoon commanders of the platoons inside his company. 
They had been warned by the lieutenant general herself to approach cautiously and keep an eye out for anything suspicious. The front tanks press forward and soon there are tightly grouped houses on both sides of the road. They are no longer on the outskirts. Nothing can be heard other than the engines of their tanks. The city is completely deserted. After a few minutes of continuing, they come up to a point where there are two rather tall buildings on both sides. We should pick. Massive explosions occur on the buildings on both sides. The ground shakes as the buildings crumble and come down onto the road. Back up. Two tanks of the company are buried under the rubble. The commanding officer of the company gets on his Magi radio. First lieutenant? Damn it. Then he switches his radio to contact his lieutenant colonel. I'm trying to contact the second platoon leader who is in one of the two tanks but he isn't respawn. A shot rang out. The commander of the tank next to Captain Hergos had opened up his hatch to get a view of what happened. Said commander was now slumping to the side of the hatch. Stay in your tanks. Lieutenant Colonel, we are pulling back. Captain Hergos' company backs up as fast as possible. A commander of another tank in the company comes up on the Magi radio. Explosions occur around them as grenades are thrown at them from an unknown source. The good thing is that the grenades did not have enough explosive power to damage the tanks. We got them. Leonid and 300 of his men are defending the city and covering the retreat of the 52nd Infantry Regiment and the civilians. They are in a happy mood after destroying and blocking off the enemy tanks. By planting the dynamite they got from the 52nd Infantry Regiment on the houses on the entrance roads, they plan to destroy and block off any tanks that try to make their way into the city. He had also posted snipers in various locations around the city in order to inflict more casualties. Okay men, we will be facing many more attacks. Don't falter. Also, bring up the field guns to the road where we destroyed the tanks. Although their artillery is seemingly useless in this circumstance because of no forward observers, no recon planes, and the houses blocking the view. Leonid has a different use for them. Lieutenant General Arabella has pulled all her tanks out of the city in case there were any more snipers. She pulls out her binoculars and once again studies the city. Let's send a platoon to that entrance. Instruct them to not get out of their tanks. There doesn't seem to be large buildings over there but have them go in single file and far apart just in case. She points towards a different entrance while giving out orders. They had lost another tank. This time the humans planted explosives directly on the road. Chapter 28, Lions Led by Donkeys 1044 March 26, 2020 CE 0822 Start 56, 196 AE Abelinum Back outside the city her staff was bickering. Won't the humans do the same thing again? Can't we just shoot at all the buildings to prevent it? That's a waste of ammunition. Can't we just go around to take the bridge? The terrain is too rough. Era sighed and looked around at her staff. Her division has been stalled and she has lost three tanks. When are the rest of the Central Army going to get here? We will have to contact them to be sure but it's most likely in a couple of days, madam. Then we will have to wait a couple of days. Lieutenant General, why do we have to wait a couple of days? Our panzers are not going to work out. We need infantry to clear the city. Usually, a Magi Panzer Division would come with infantry, artillery, and various other types of units in it but these specially created divisions, the Blitzpanzer divisions, did not. This was because the field marshals wanted to focus on speed for their new tactic called Blitzkrieg. They removed everything that could possibly slow down the panzers. The field marshals had sorely underestimated the humans who they thought would just flee in terror once they saw the tanks. Infantry, pfft, 
Lieutenant General is something wrong? You have always felt confident in our panzers. The panzers are excellent but not in cities. The roads constrict their movement and we can have at most only two panzers side by side. As it seems, ambushes can be anywhere. Continuously charging in and losing tanks is not going to work. We can try to commit our entire force to overrun them but the casualties will be significant. Then why not go through the original entrance again? Blow away the rubble and charge in. They will never expect this. We'll even use our medium tanks. We can try that tomorrow, it's getting late today. Set up camp. Throughout the night, Leonid and his men stayed vigilant. They had their weapons ready and they had posted rotating guards in case of any enemy attacks. Outside of the city, Era and her staff were finalizing plans for tomorrow. 0042 March 27, 2020 CE. 0321 Start 57, 196 AE. Five medium tanks also called the night tank, in a straight line approached the rubble that had been blown onto the streets and the stallion tanks yesterday. Fire. Adjusting to high explosives, the 75mm cannon on the night at the front of the line opens up. The rubble is blown away and there is smoke covering the front. Forward. Suddenly an explosion occurs on the tank and on the ground around it. Commander, we've been hit. The night stops. No damage. Reload and wait for the smoke to clear. The smoke cleared before another shot hits them. Anti-tank guns in front. Open fire. In front of them are what seems to be three anti-tank guns. The night's first shot destroys the one in the middle. Leonid viewed the battle with his binoculars. The 75mm artillery is not doing anything to the enemy tank. Get the 155mm in position. The Magasian infantry crewing the 75mms bravely continued to pummel the night tank with all they had. Even resorting to using their guns and magic once their artillery was blown up. Among the men were some capable of destroying a Machian Industro IIS. To no avail, they were cut down by the night's machine gun and main cannon. The upper front glassy plate armor of the night tank is 80 mm thick with an angle of 55 degrees. This means that anything trying to penetrate the front armor will have to go through at least 139 mm of armor. The 75 mm artillery with high explosive magi shells used by the Magasians will not do much to the night tank. Magasian cannons are very different from elven magi cannons. Magasian cannons use normal shells that are packed inside with mana as explosives. Elven magi cannons use extremely dense mana as the shells. The elven magi shells can be molded into either armor piercing or high explosive. The night tanks continued rumbling forward with the rest of the division behind it. As the first night tank crossed a four-way intersection, a massive explosion occurred on the left side of it. The four night tanks behind it came to a stop. The commander of the night behind the night that was fired upon tried to radio it. No response came back. The night in front of our formation is destroyed. A 155mm artillery had been in a lucky position. The lower side armor of a knight is only at most 50 mm thick with no angle. The 155 mm was positioned at the road that was cutting through the main entrance road in order to surprise anything that came down the main entrance road. Although being artillery, it easily went through the side armor of the knight and exploded in it which killed the crew. A few minutes later, era side. Another tank lost. We are staying outside the city for now. Contact the infantry corps and ask them when they will arrive. 0524 March 27, 2020 CE. 0542 Start 57, 196 AE. 
The rest of the elven Blitzpanzer divisions had arrived outside the city of Anbalayam. They formed together as the first elven Blitzpanzer Corps. Their commander, general of the Panzers Tanelsark Sina, would arrive with the Central Army. Lieutenant General Belra, nice to see you again? I'm surprised you are not inside yet. Era narrowed her eyes as she looked at her greeter. Lieutenant General Bifine, how nice to see you again. Lieutenant General Falra Bifine of the 6th Elven Blitzpanzer Division smiled. Never expected you to be so scared of going into a city. The humans have it well defended. Falra laughed. Humans defending? Let me show you how it's done, dear Era. You women have no courage. Era grumbled. As if you will fare any better. The commander of the 9th Elven Blitzpanzer Division, Lieutenant General Filson Waesnon, looked at them and shook his head. Ever since the three of them had met after being tasked with this mission, Falra and Era have been on very bad terms. Many days before the start of the invasion of Valen, Elven Nation, Era entered the room and saluted. Nice to meet you, sir. I'm Lieutenant General Era Belra. I will be in charge of the 11th Elven Blitzpanzer Division. Lieutenant General Bifine smiled that he had when meeting Lieutenant General Waesnon and General of the Panzer Sark Sina dropped at this moment. A woman. Era looked questionably at Falra. What? Falra turned toward Tanel. General of the Panzers, this is utter ridiculousness. A woman in charge of this important mission? How did she even get this high of a rank, sucking up to some superior? Now now Lieutenant General Bifine, Lieutenant General Belra is quite a distinguished panzer strategist. She has even written some books about it herself. In the elven military, women were accepted. However, this didn't mean that they were approved by everyone. Of course, not many women had joined. This meant that high-ranking female military officials were rare. Most women were low-ranking soldiers and only served for a short time as an adventure. 0530 March 27, 2020 CE. 0545 Start 57, 196 A. Abelinum. Lieutenant General Bifine had discussed his plans with his staff and has now set off with his division towards the city. Stupid. Filson, you going to try anything? Filson didn't really care much about their rivalry. He is focused on accomplishing the mission with as little casualties as possible. I will see what happens. A few minutes later. Explosions occurred in the city as the 6th Elven Blitzpanzer Division dueled with what remained of Leonid's 2nd Battalion of the 151st Infantry Regiment. In what used to be Colonel Donatus's headquarters in the tavern, Leonid pointed at a crudely drawn map of the city. Bring up more of the 155 millimeters. Position them right there. Go. Time is of the essence. Leonid had split the city up into three sectors. The western part of the city was under Captain Minor Valus, the center was under Captain Sevso, and the east was under Captain Vakula. Each sector had at most 1875 mm artilleries and six 155 mm artilleries. Other than the Magi Dynamite, the artillery was the only other proven weapon that could take out the enemy tanks. Now, all three sectors were reporting attacks. This was a clear indication of an all-out enemy attack. Their remaining planted dynamite took out some tanks at first. After that their 75mm artillery had easily taken out a few more of the enemy tanks but then bigger tanks like the one they had faced a few hours earlier for the first time had shown up. Having planned an all-out attack to overwhelm and overrun the humans, Falra sent companies of stallions through all entrances that were facing towards them. The thin front armor of the stallions, at only 30mm, made it easier for them to be taken out by the 75 MMS guarding the roads. However, 
With multiple companies rushing in, the stallions were able to take out some of the enemy 75 MMS. An intense battle on the roads occurred as shells flew. Disabled 75 MMS were abandoned as stallion tanks exploded left to right from hits. In the end, the stallions had to pull back because of the mounting losses. The report got to Falra. Inferiors with their dirty tricks. Send in the knights. 0553 March 27, 2020 CE. 0556 Start 57, 196 AE. The knights moved forward and this time the remaining 75 MMS were completely ineffective and were pushed aside. Seeing that the 155 MMS were their most precious weapons since they had been able to take out the bigger enemy tanks, they were placed on roads that intersected the entrance roads. This allowed the buildings to hide the 155 MMS and allowed the 155 MMS to surprise the enemy tanks. On one of the entrance roads, a platoon of knights started to pass a four-way intersection. An explosion to the right side of the first knight disabled it. Another knight tried to go left of the disabled knight to use it as cover whilst slowly traversing its turret to the right towards where the shot came from. An explosion to their left causes some damage. However, the knight was able to fire off its gun towards the artillery on the right. A second shot from the left disabled the knight. 155 MMS had been placed on both sides of the road that intersected the entrance road. This was to ensure that no enemy was able to cross. The commander of the knight that was trying to destroy the 155 mm to the right made a fatal mistake thinking there was nothing to their left. The remaining knights could have pushed through but at the expense of more mounting losses. They turned back. 0612 March 27, 2020 CE. 0606 Start 57, 196 AE. Era was leaning against her stallion outside the camp as Falra's knight rolled up. Falra exited his tank and walked past Era. So how did that go for you Lieutenant Colonel Byfine? Shut up. In the end, Falra lost 16 stallions and 7 knights. The higher UPS would probably be extremely unhappy. The tanks that the Blitzpanzer divisions were equipped with were the Elven's best in-service tanks. 0938 March 27, 2020 CE. 0749 Start 57, 196 AE. Near the Verona River. Colonel Donatus got out of his command car. After riding for more than a day, his regiment had finally crossed the Verona. There he found soldiers and tanks posted. He walked up to a soldier who saluted him. Who is the highest commanding officer here? Captain Forianus, sir. Take me to him. Kuso entered the tent where Captain Forianus was supposed to be. There he saw a man looking at a piece of paper. Captain Forianus. The man didn't look up. Whom am I speaking with? I'm Colonel Kuso Donatus of the 52nd Infantry Regiment. With that Captain Forianus jolted up and saluted. Sorry, sir? Captain Spurious Forianus. What is your unit doing here? We are supposed to guard the bridge. Wasn't there orders to blow it up after my unit came through? Ah, uh, oh yes, there were but they were scrapped. We got orders not to blow it up. Why? The first army is mobilizing much faster than expected. With this, we don't need to blow up the bridge. Get me in contact with your superior immediately. 1248 March 27, 2020 CE. 0924 Start 57, 196 AE. Abelinum. Leonid looked at his beleaguered men. They have been reduced from the beginning of 300 to around only 240 left. They have lost 15 75 mm and 4 155 mm. If another all-out attack came they should still be able to hold. However, 
If a third one occurred, the probability of repelling it was questionable. Men, do you know what is behind us? The Verona is? Our brothers in arms are preparing for a counterattack there. If we fail, our country falls? Remember that? The captains and I have agreed to stay here to the end? Are you willing to stay with us? Cheers rose out. I. Chapter 29, Last Stand. 2308 March 27, 2020 CE. 0234 Start 58, 196 AE. Western region of the Verona River. A detachment from the First Army guarded one of the many major bridges on the western side of the Verona River. Sandbag positions, trenches, and tanks were all placed to cover anything that would come across the bridge. A soldier looking at the other side of the bridge noticed something through the morning mist. Enemy tanks on the other side of the river. A large enemy tank got onto the bridge. Their tank, an A1 tank, situated right on the exit of the bridge aimed towards the enemy tank on the other side. Before it could open fire with its 75mm gun, the enemy tank took it out in one hit to the front. The 3rd Blitzpanzer Division's night tank continued down the bridge after destroying the human's puny metal box that could barely be called a tank. Machine gunfire from the human positions was completely futile as the knight pushed aside the destroyed human tank blocking the way. It was met with many humans' puny metal boxes that tried to destroy it with their puny little guns. The entire detachment was wiped out as tanks from the 3rd Blitzpanzer Division poured in. The knights greatly outclassed the A1S. The shells fired by the A1S exploded on the knight's armor and did nothing. The knights could destroy the A1S in a single shot to the front of it. The stallions with their fast-firing 20mm guns quickly overran any human infantry position. 0246 March 28, 2020 CE. 0423 Start 58, 196 AE. First Army Headquarters. Colonel Donatus despaired at the news. Almost all the bridges on the east and west of the Verona River have been taken. The only reason the central bridges were holding was that the enemy had been held back by Lt. Col. Primus. Military advisor Caius had finally agreed to blow up the central bridges. We should have blown up all of them? What was the military advisor thinking? 1040 March 29, 2020 CE. 0820 Start 29, 196 AE. Abilinum. There were no further attacks for two days. However, this didn't mean that they could just pull out. With the bridge blown up behind them, they had nowhere to retreat to. Leonid hoped that the 52nd Infantry Regiment was able to get across and blow the bridge up. There were no magrams in the city so he couldn't contact them to make sure. Right now, the enemy was right outside the city ready to run them over the moment they saw the chance to. For Leonid, these two days were good rest for his men. This changed on the third day. 0550 March 30, 2020 CE. 0555 Start 30, 196 AE. In addition to the 1st Blitzpanzer Corp, the 3rd Magipanzer Corp, 9th Infantry Corp, and 15th Infantry Corps were situated right out of Anbalayam. Lieutenant Colonel Balra, Bifin, and Waisnan, I demand an explanation of why you are all still outside of the city. Era speaks up. General Sarksina, human resistance is too stiff. Too stiff. Multiple tanks were lost in trying to breach the defenses of the city. I'm requesting an artillery bombardment of the city and then tanks supported by infantry to go in. General of the Panzer Sarksina sighed as he looked at the other two lieutenant colonels. A few minutes later, after talking with the general of the Central Army, general of the Panzer Sarksina returned to them. Bombardment will begin within 30 minutes. 
Then fortress and night tanks will be sent in along with infantry. Once we secure the city, we will reorganize and begin for a push past the river. Yes, sir. 0650 March 30th, 2020 CE. 0625 Start 30th, 196 AE. 105 mm light howitzers and 150 mm heavy howitzers lined the grassy plains outside of Anbalayam. They were all from the artillery regiments in the infantry and Maji Panzer Corps. An officer beside one of the artillery flipped open his pocket watch. Fire. Leonid was playing cards inside the tavern with his three captains when he heard a whistling noise. Artillery get down. The men in the tavern all hit the ground. The ground shook as multiple explosions occurred outside. A soldier came rushing in. Lieutenant Colonel, we are being bombarded by artillery. It's quite obvious. I'm asking what we should do. Get in cover. What else? A shell landed nearby, collapsing a part of the tavern. Fifteen minutes later, silence filled the air as the explosions stopped. A couple of people were coughing from the dust gathered up by the collapse. Leonid got up and dusted himself. Is everyone fine? Yes. Minor scratches. I think I broke my leg. Medic. Leonid looked left to right at all of his men in the tavern. They looked back at him. This is it, men. It's possible to expect an all-out assault. The main enemy army is probably here. This is where we make our last stand. For the Imperium. For the Imperium. Leonid grabbed his officer pistol. He looked at his captains. Let's go. I hope Lars is watching us. He is. Let's show these invaders what it means to mess with us. 0720 March 30th, 2020 CE. 0640 Start 30th, 196 AE. Fortress tanks with platoons of infantry crowded behind them entered through many of the entrances to the city. The already bombed city was further reduced to rubble by the artillery bombardments. They cleared any building that hadn't been reduced to rubble. The buildings on the outer part of the city were completely vacant. On one of the roads, the fortress tank was coming up to its first intersection. It stopped and the infantry behind it advanced forward. They had learned from the earlier attempts made by the Blitzpanzer Corps that the humans liked to hide their anti-tank guns where intersections were in order to surprise any tanks that tried to go past. An infantryman looks over the corner to see the massive 155mm artillery cannon being operated by multiple humans. It seemed to have survived the earlier bombardment unscratched. The elven infantryman rushed up and fired upon the artillery crew that was expecting another tank to come through. A firefight ensued as the panicked artillery crew fired back at the elven infantryman. Elven submachine guns greatly outclassed the rifles that the humans had. Suffering only some casualties, the artillery was neutralized. Behind them, their tank proceeded forward. The fortress rumbled forward as elves behind it followed. All of a sudden, rapid firing could be heard and the elves behind the tank were struck and killed. It came from one of the closest intact buildings. Machine gun in that building. The elves peppered the building where the firing came from with their rifles and submachine guns. The fortress slowly traversed its turret and raised its gun towards the building and destroyed the front portion of it with a high explosive shell. Clear those buildings. A platoon commander motioned for his soldiers to spread out and look through the buildings for any possible humans. An elf kicked open a door to one of the buildings and was met with a hailstorm of bullets before dying. The other elves around him stuck to the side of the building to avoid the bullets. The elf closest to the door threw a grenade into the building. Seconds later, an explosion occurred. They rushed into the building to find the blown bits of some humans. Clear. In another building, an elf looked through the second floor. 
He opened a door and is met with a knife aimed straight at his throat. Hand-to-hand -hand combat and gunfights ensued throughout the city in many of the buildings. Clearing the city took nearly an entire day. 0844 March 30, 2020 CE. 0722 Start 30, 196 AE. Leonid held tight on his pistol as he crouched behind a flipped-over table in the room. A couple of other men were with him. Proclus, Aulus, and Agrippa were probably already dead but he would be joining them soon. He heard the door to the building being opened. He looked over the table. Ready man. The soldiers around him nodded. Time seemingly slowed down as footsteps drew near to the door to the room he was in. He saw the doorknob slowly turn. Fire. Leonid and the soldiers around him shot multiple times at the door before stopping. Leonid saw something being thrown in. The object clinked on the ground. Grenade? Get down. Leonid ducked behind the table as the grenade exploded. Leonid's vision shook and his ears rang. Firing broke out as his surviving men tried to kill those that were entering. Leonid once again looked up from his table and started shooting. He felt intense pain on his right arm and fell over. Another grenade went off in the room. 0900 March 30, 2020 CE. 0730 Start 30, 196 AE. Elven infantry completely occupied the city. All the human defenders had fought to the last man. The general of the Central Army was sitting in his chair resting when a soldier came with a Magi radio report. General, the battle is finished. We have cleared the entire city. Good. How did it go? As of right now, we are estimated to have around a couple of hundred casualties. A couple hundred. Sir, the humans fought to the end. There must have been a regiment-sized force defending the city. Some humans might have escaped into the mountains but there shouldn't be much. No matter. Did we receive the reports on how the western and eastern armies are? Yes, sir. We did. They took their side of the bridges less than two days ago. They captured many human soldiers and have disposed of them. The advanced landing grounds have also been set up behind us and are ready. Well, it seems like we are behind. We should arrive at our bridge within two days if things go smoothly. Magi radio them that we are not ready yet. Yes, sir. Six days ago, 1346 March 24, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. In the White House, the elven invasion of the Magus had become a rather major problem. President Hay was discussing the current situation with his staff. More information about the elves had come in. He questioned Secretary of State Clifford about her meeting with the Magusian diplomats. What does the diplomat from the Magus have to say? When we questioned them, they said that they didn't know why the elves are invading them. Have they requested our help? None at all. They even said that they were doing fine when I asked if they needed assistance. President Hay looked over to Secretary of Defense Roberts Krilson. What information do we have on these elves? The images we have taken of the elven continents have confirmed that they are a World War II level nation. Their tanks and planes are eerily similar to the ones used by Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany. From the images, we have seen what seems to be Tiger is and Stukas. Any explanation for that similarity? The only sensible thing that we could come up with is that the technological development of the elves coincidentally went on a similar path as Germany. All other ideas sound straight out of science fiction. We got transported to another world. The science fiction ideas might be plausible at this point. Hell, fantasy is even plausible. These are elves we are talking about. In addition, Mr. President, we did notice a difference between Nazi Germany and the elves. The navy of the elves is much more numerous than that of Nazi Germany. 
The elves seem to have a lot of World War II era aircraft carriers. Makes sense seeing that they are an island nation like Japan. The most concerning part comes from the drones that we sent to observe the battles. What information did we get? The elves are burning entire towns to the ground. They might be massacring humans. Here are some of the photos that were taken from the RQ-170. The RQ-170 was a stealth recon drone used by the United States. In order to avoid detection by possible elven radar, stealth was needed for observing the elves. Closing his eyes, the president sighed. We are definitely going to need more units in the mock. Diplomacy with the elves will be very dangerous. Our best option is to make contact with the elves on the sea and hope they won't shoot at our ships. Should we even try to make diplomatic contact? They will most likely open fire the moment we get close. They also seem just like the Nazis from our world. These actions are basically crimes against humanity. We need to demand that they stop their actions right now. How about this? We send a carrier strike group to the nearest group of elven ships to try to establish contact. If they do something threatening, we shelve this diplomacy thing. That will give us justification for a war against the elves. Something Airsoft AL recommended that I do but I didn't. I still find it funny so I'm writing it down here. This is not an actual part of the novel. In the White House, the elven invasion of the Magus had become a rather major problem. President Hay was discussing the current situation with his staff. Mr. President, they are invading the Magus. Don't care. B but sir? People are being massacred. Meh. Sir, they are Nazis. Elven interlude. 150 years ago. Of Valen, Elven Nation. The moon shined brightly over the seemingly quiet city. The king was tired. Another day dealing with the nobles across his country and making deals with the human countries. These human countries were a bit troublesome but he had been able to keep a relatively stable peace with them through trade and various other diplomatic activities. It was quite beneficial in some ways too. The resources provided by humans had greatly improved the economy. Of course, some of the nobles had demanded an invasion of the humans to take their resources. An invasion of the human countries was preposterous. Due to the vast number of them, along with the time and resources required, would make such an operation impossible. A servant quickly burst through the doors to his throne room. Your Highness. What is it? You didn't even knock. I'm sorry, your highness but this is of great urgency. We have a rebellion on our hands. The king was surprised. A rebellion? During these times? The economy was doing great. Who would lead a rebellion during such prosperous times? Where is this happening? They have stormed multiple barracks in our city and taken them by surprise. How? The king sighed as he realized something. This was his fault. In such peaceful times, he had neglected the military. Underfunded and barely trained, they were more like a peacekeeping force for the country. In the past three decades, there were no signs of threats. The human countries loved elven technology and trade. The elven economy benefited from trade with humans. This led to a golden age for the elves. However, there were some of those who were unhappy with the humans. The fact that the humans were treated as equals seemed to disgust them. The king had paid them no mind. They couldn't possibly rebel when times were so good. No one would support them. With the king thinking that there was no possibility of rebellion or invasion by the humans, Slowly he cut off military spending and management. Now it was backfiring on him. Alert the military commanders and palace guards of the current situation. Send word out to all remaining barracks and soldiers under our control to prepare for battle. Understood your highness. Twenty minutes later. The sound of marching feet resounded outside of the palace. 
The king looked out from his balcony to witness seemingly hundreds of torches marching towards the palace. The sound of boots slamming down in perfect unison indicated that whoever was trying to take over had trained their men for some time. Where are the soldiers? We have sent a messenger car to the remaining barracks, your highness. They aren't going to get here in time. Are the palace guards ready? The guards have closed the gates, your highness. In mere minutes, the gates to the palace were breached. Using artillery captured from nearby barracks, the rebels gained entry to the palace. Fighting raged in front of the palace as the king and his family was guided towards an escape route in the palace. Your Highness, our soldiers are on the other side to receive you. Many minutes later, the king walked out of the concealed hole on the side of a hill a few miles from the palace. Kingdom soldiers with swords appeared out of the dark to greet him. Your Highness, thank goddess you are safe. We immediately came from our barracks the moment we heard about it. The rest of the king's family appeared out of the hole. Come on let's go. The soldier beckoned him forward and the king walked towards them. The king then noticed the sword that the soldier was holding. It was dripping with blood. The king stopped a few feet from the soldier. Something wasn't right. The king's eyes widened as he felt immense pain in his stomach. The king looked down to see a sword in his stomach. He finally noticed what was wrong. Normal soldiers only had rifles. Swords weren't something that a soldier was equipped with. The king collapsed as his family behind him screamed in fear. Just before the elven invasion of the Magus. In one of the many streets of the capital of the elven nation, a boy happily skipped down the street to his house. He had just witnessed the awesome national military parade that indicated the start of their rightful place in the whole world. He was even able to see their leader, son of their savior, who would lead them to prosperous elven world order. He was extremely curious about the barbarians that resided in the rest of the world. Right now, he just couldn't wait for the elven's hammer of justice to strike down those inferiors. There was also a probability that he would be able to see a human. He had heard of plans to bring some back to serve as slaves like the inferiors they are. He was excited to see the inferiors that his teachers had talked so much about. Many many years ago he had learned in school about the existence of humans and the wider world. Then he had learned about the inferiority of humans. From his science classes, he had learned that humans had shorter lifespans, weaker magic, and inferior technology. Their shorter lifespans and weaker magic were a clear indication that they were not the blessed beings of this planet. They were a deformed evil being. Their inferior technology also showed how barbarian they were and how inferior they were to the elves. In history class, he had learned about the stupidity of the one who had ruled when the elven nation was called the elven kingdom. The last of the elven kings had listened and was even welcoming to the humans because of how much benefit the humans had brought to him. The humans promised riches, women, and personal benefits to the king so that the king would allow them to steal elven technology. The common elves suffered greatly because of the humans. Society and economy fell apart because of human influence. It sounded ridiculous to him. How stupid was that last king? When the elves had discovered the humans by sailing to them, the humans acted like cavemen and had technology comparable to the ages of iron. They should have subjugated them. The technology given to them by the last elven king elevated the humans' power to the point of being comparable to the elves. The last king had brainwashed much of the elves to think that these vile beings were friends. The economy started to collapse after that. Then in 50 AE, the wise elves who saw through the treachery such as their savior Erven Harris led a glorious revolution, overthrew the corrupt king, and threw the barbaric humans out of the continent after a magnificent battle that crushed the humans.
Most would think that after that the brainwashed elves would come to their senses but even now some of the older generations were still the same. They still said stuff that the last elven king wasn't so bad. His school has taught him to pity those of the older generation because they did not understand that they had been exploited. There were efforts to re-educate the older generations but it wasn't always successful. These still brainwashed were looked at with distrust and pity by everyone. The boy entered his house and happily went to his mother to tell her about the great news. She was busy cooking up dinner so she wasn't able to attend the parade. Today's dinner was supposed to be mainly some type of fish with bread and some meat. Fish was something that the boy has constantly been eating. It was most likely because they lived underwater in an air bubble so that food was mainly fish. Of course, there were places where cattle and crops were raised. He hoped that once the continent surfaces that he could have more meat and crops. The land taken from the humans would definitely allow this to happen. At the beginning of the elven invasion of the Magus, Terran Van Harris looked through the folders on his desk. Behind him was the flag of his country, red in the background with a blazing yellow sun in the middle and a black cross on it. The folders he was looking at were details of massive projects, super weapons, some percentage of the national budget and various top minds of the country were working on these, their newest super tanks, super planes, and much much more. Some of these projects were even finished. These were very important. Sure they were winning right now against the humans but that might not hold true in the near future. Terran understood that the humans greatly outnumbered the elven population and that at some point the number of humans could become unbearable for the national military. The usage of these weapons would allow them to counter the humans' quantity with much superior quality. They would also cover for any possible surprises that the humans could throw at them. His scientists and experts had, for the most part, accurately predicted the technological level of the humans. Of course, there was a great disparity in technology between different continents of the humans as shown by the less developed kingdoms. This wasn't worrying since to his knowledge, there was also no possibility of humans more advanced than the Empire. After defeating the Empire, there would only be even more inferior humans left to deal with. The superweapons were also meant to combat a possibly more dangerous enemy. Terran only believes a possibly more dangerous enemy because they might not even exist. There were many ancient elven prophecies of the appearance of horned beasts in the far future with terrifying weapons. The truth of these prophecies was very dubious. However, it gave him more excuses for creating the super weapons so he was okay with them. A thing that had interested him about the Empire was their change in flag. The documented flag of the Empire had a blue crown in the middle of a black cross with a white background. Now the Empire's flag had changed in a minor way. Instead of the blue crown, it now had two blue swords crossing each other on a blue pentagram. The pentagram represented magic so that could explain the change. From reports, the Empire was using magic. That magic was definitely stolen from the elves. However, it was a very inferior magic. They didn't seem to have invented the Magi battery yet. Such a wondrous invention. It meant that the elves didn't need to find resources to power their vehicles or factories to make ammunition. The mana that the elves have could be poured and mixed with others' mana into a Magi battery. Of course, it had many flaws and still needed more development. A living body was still the perfect vessel for the usage of mana. The Magi battery could only be used for simple things like power, signal waves, and being able to become dense enough to be used as ammunition. It also had a limit of mana it could carry and it wore down quite quickly which caused it to need constant replacement. The perfect Magi battery would be one that has no limit in mana, no need for replacement, and an ability to do the things an elf can with their mana. 
That kind Magi battery was very far in the future. It might not even be possible but if his scientists could figure it out, the elves would be unstoppable. Another flaw in the Magi battery was the way it was used as ammunition. Next to the main gun, there was a monodensifier connected to the Magi battery. The speed of the reload depended on the shell size. The bigger and more powerful the shell was, the more time it took to form. If they could make the monodensifier faster, they could greatly increase the rate of fire for the medium and heavy tanks. A weapon with the power of a tank cannon and the fire rate of a machine gun would be terrifying. Scientists were trying to find ways to do so but there has yet to be much progress. Yet another flaw of the Magi battery was the lack of efficiency. It took multiple elves to fill up one which would only last a few hours depending on the consumption rate of the machine. The more complex or heavier the machine, the shorter amount of time it had to run on a single Magi battery. For example, the pilots on their planes could refill theirs in flight by using all their mana but it would only last on average at most another 30 minutes before it was out of power. An elf's mana took many hours to recharge. It varied from elf to elf. Well, in the end, the fate of the human species had been decided the moment the elven continent surfaced. When his father and great Magus were still alive, they would plan and discuss weapon development and strategies. The great Magus was a genius at weapons development. Most of the current and future weapons were designed by him. However, he denied his genius and called it visions given to him by their gracious goddess, the mother of all elves. This was all for the invading humans. Terran's father, Erven Harris, held extreme hate of the humans. His hate and belief that the humans were inferior to elves were shared by his son. The humans are finished. Chapter 30, The Situation at Sea 0858 March 23, 2020 CE 0729 Start 23, 196 AE In the ocean between the Soana League and Magus Imperium The six submarines of the Magusian 9th Submarine Squadron neared the seas where there were reports of enemy ships. Their mission was to infiltrate and sink the enemy convoys. It seemed to be quite simple. When they got to the area where enemy warships patrolled, they would submerge and slip past them. Magasian submarines were more submersibles than true submarines. This meant that they operated mostly on the surface and only submerged to avoid detection or to sneak up on enemies. They had to surface to recharge their batteries. Commander Chaos Marola was the commander of one of the six submarines of the 9th Submarine Squadron. He looked out towards the sea through his periscope. Turning it, he noticed something on the horizon. Enemy warships. Seems to be a group of destroyers. Running up to an enemy patrol already was not a good sign. It was quite lucky that they had already submerged. There shouldn't be any way for the enemies to detect them. Just in case, he ordered his submarine to dive deeper. In an elven destroyer, a sonarman stared intently at his equipment before looking up. Captain, our sonar is picking up a lot of pings. There could be a group of submarines nearby. The captain stared intently at the equipment. Can't be ours. We don't have any assigned here. Fire the depth charges. Sudden explosions rocked Marula's submarine. The crew was confused. How were they detected? They weren't on the surface. These were the last thoughts of the crew. A massive explosion split the submarine in two. 0524 March 24, 2020 CE. 0542 Start 24, 196 AE. Magus Combined Task Force. There were reports from patrolling elven submarine and destroyer squadrons of a large empire fleet approaching the route the elven convoys took to get to the empire. With this, the elven navy decided that this was their chance to wipe out the human navy. 
Wolf packs of submarines were gathered to harass and sink as many human ships in that fleet as possible. In addition, a fleet of three carriers, five battleships, 11 cruisers, and 21 destroyers was also gathered to face off against the human fleet. The plan to stop the elven convoys by using submarines failed completely. The submarines were somehow easily detected and sunk by the elven warships. Admiral Menius Vadius had been ordered to lead a large fleet in an effort to stop any elven ship from getting to the mainland. It had been finally confirmed that the enemies they were facing off against were elves. Admiral Vadius was not at all confident of his victory. He understood that they were facing a super-advanced civilization. The only reason that the Magus Imperium had their current technology was because of the elves. The elves now might even have the same technological capabilities that the Americans had. He had read about what happened in the American Mock War. What happened to the Mock will probably now happen to them. But he still had a duty to do and he wouldn't just run away because he was scared. More than half of the Magusian Navy was dispatched to destroy any elven naval assets in the seas which the elves were using to transport their units. 14 pre-dreadnought battleships, 5 dreadnoughts, 20 cruisers, and 50 destroyers were gathered to try to stop the elves. A massive explosion rocked the Miss, Magus Imperium ship, Honor, a heavy cruiser, and a water plume rose from its port. More explosions occurred on other ships. Admiral, multiple ships are reported to be taking on water because of torpedo attacks. We are being attacked by submarines. Where are they? We are looking around the ocean but we can't see any, sir. Drop the depth charges. Massive plumes of water rose as Magusian ships dropped the explosives into the ocean. 0200 March 26, 2020 CE. 0400 Start 26, 196 AE in the ocean between the Elven Continent and Magus Imperium. The depth charges seemed ineffective. The fleet was harassed by Elven submarines many times. By the third day, they had lost 15 destroyers and 8 cruisers. Because the dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts were at the very center of the massive formation, they were more protected and none were sunk. 0904 March 26, 2020 C. 0732 Start 26, 196 A. Elven Interception Fleet. Admiral Adurm Vainery looked as one of his staff pushed a couple of red blocks on the map towards a couple of blue blocks. Earlier scoutings from Elven destroyers have allowed an estimation of the whereabouts of the human fleet. We should now be getting close to the human fleet. Our submarines should have whittled them down a bit. They will be in range of our aircraft in less than 15 minutes. Admiral Vainery narrowed his eyes and drew a circle on the map with his fleet at the center. Recon. 1024 March 26, 2020 CE. 0812 Start 26, 196 AE. Recon aircraft had finally found the human fleet. The fleet was well within the range of the elven planes. Airmen ran towards their aircraft on the decks of the aircraft carriers. Torpedo bombers, dive bombers, and fighters were all loaded up and ready. One by one, the aircraft took off from the decks of the aircraft carriers and into the sky. 36 torpedo bombers and 36 dive bombers escorted by 36 fighters. 108 total aircraft. 1100 March 26, 2020 CE. 0830 Start 26, 196 AE. Magus Combined Task Force. Enemy Aircraft. A sailor shouted at the top of his lungs on the missiles, the dreadnought that Admiral Vadius was on. Vadius was surprised. It didn't make sense at all. How was their enemy aircraft in the middle of the ocean? Then he remembered that the Americans also had the same capability. 
The three inch anti aircraft guns on the dreadnought opened up towards the swarm of approaching planes. The destroyers and cruisers on the outer part of the group and have anti aircraft guns had already started opening fire. The first formations of aircraft that approached were biplanes. They started to seemingly skim the water. One of the elven aircraft was hit as it got close. A flame appeared on its tail and it crashed into the water. A few seconds later, objects detached from the bottom of the first formation of aircraft and hit the water. Explosions ripped two of the destroyers apart. Admiral, they are dropping torpedoes. Shoot down as many of them as possible. Almost all of the elven aircraft were able to drop their torpedoes. Only a few were shot down. Multiple destroyers and cruisers had been hit and were sinking. No evasive maneuvers were performed by the ships since they weren't prepared for air attacks in the middle of the sea. More formations of biplanes came and wreaked havoc. A different type of formation approached. They were monoplanes. This time, instead of dropping low onto the water, it continued at its high altitude. The aircraft started a steep dive down towards them. What do we do? Evasive maneuvers. Avoid them. These aircraft seemed to be aiming at the larger ships. Bombs dropped from them. The lumbering dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts couldn't avoid them. An explosion rocked the top of a dreadnought and dark smoke plumed into the sky. More explosions rocked the same ship. Admiral? The Miss Tiberius is being abandoned. Why? They aren't sinking. The conning tower has been destroyed and the guns are completely disabled. The planes buzzed around the fleet like flies around garbage. The Magasian ships had too few or zero anti-aircraft guns. Even the dreadnoughts only had two anti-aircraft guns aboard each. The elven aircraft waves stopped and the chaos subsided. Damage report? How many ships did we lose? The men in the brig of the Miss Saella started receiving these reports. An officer quickly read out the compiled information to the Admiral. Four pre-dreadnoughts were sunk, a dreadnought was disabled, three cruisers were sunk, six destroyers were sunk, and a dreadnought was heavily damaged but can continue. Some other ships received light damages. Rescue the survivors. Admiral Vadius was visibly upset. Almost half of the fleet was sunk. And it wasn't even because of naval battles. It was from attacks from submarines or aircraft. They only had 10 pre-dreadnoughts, 4 dreadnoughts, 9 cruisers, and 29 destroyers left. The Admiral looked out towards his sinking ships. They had only shot down two planes. We are turning around. Set a course back to port. But sir, what about the mission? This entire fleet will be sunk before we can even actually engage the enemy or their convoys. Send a report to HQ. Tell them we are taking too many losses and that we are returning. 1124 March 26, 2020 CE. 0842 start 26. 196 A. Anti-aircraft guns from the destroyers when the outer part of the fleet started again. More aircraft. They were subjected to the same hell they had experienced before. 1124 March 26, 2020 C. 0842 start 26. 196 A. Elven interception fleet. Reports from our aircraft indicate that the human fleet has turned around. Admiral Vainery watched as his staff pushed the blue blocks away and the red blocks forward on the map. He looked up after thinking for a little while. Pursue them? Admiral, we will be within firing distance in 15 minutes. Good. 1154 March 26, 2020 CE. 0857 start 26, 196 A. Magus Combined Task Force. Ships spotted on the horizon. After the second air attack, the Magus fleet had begun limping back to port. 
The second attack reduced their numbers to seven pre-dreadnoughts, four dreadnoughts, seven cruisers, and 24 destroyers. Many of their ships were damaged. They had downed some more aircraft but it didn't really matter. The three aircraft carriers were left a bit behind the rest of the elven fleet since they were only meant for air support. In a straight line, the battleships, cruisers, and destroyers ran parallel to the human fleet formations. Two of the battleships were Van Harris class battleships. The other three were the older but still very new aligner class battleships which were named after the former Great Magus. Admiral Vadia stood with eyes wide open as he looked at the elven battleships he faced. They were much larger than any battleship in the Magus's arsenal. The three triple 11-inch guns of the aligner classes, the four twin 15-inch guns of the Van Harris classes, and the heavy cruisers opened up in a salvo. Admiral Vadius watched as the shells came flying towards his fleet. The five twin 12-inch guns of the Magus's newest dreadnoughts were not close enough to hit their targets so his fleet was turning towards the elven firing line in order to get closer. He heard the whistling of the shells as they got closer. His dreadnought was lucky since it was at the front of the other dreadnoughts and pre-dreadnoughts. The elves seemed to have targeted the middle of the fleet. The shells rocked his fleet. A turret blew off from one of the pre-dreadnoughts in a massive explosion. The conning tower of a dreadnought was seemingly leveled. Multiple other ships that were hit suffered horrifying damage. The elven destroyers loosed their torpedoes as they got closer. No torpedo trails could be seen. The agility and torpedo range of the elven destroyers prevented them from being easily attacked by the human cruisers and destroyers. Some of the torpedoes slammed into the human destroyers. The human fleet seemed to be doing a suicidal last dash towards the elven fleet. The battleships and the cruisers opened up a second salvo towards the human's fleet. Admiral Vadius's ship was miraculously still floating after his fleet was pummeled two times. Now the remainder of his ships faced off against the elven fleet which was now within his fleet's firing range. His pummeled fleet numbered only three pre-dreadnoughts, two dreadnoughts, four cruisers, and sixteen destroyers. Most of them have suffered some damage. The bigger ships opened fire as the destroyers attempted to get closer in order to get the enemies into torpedo range. A shell struck the Garrick, one of the aligner class battleships, and did some damage. Most shells missed. An elven cruiser was struck and suffered heavier damages. Another salvo came again from the elven fleet. This time Admiral Vadius's ship wasn't as lucky. The missileus was struck multiple times and its entire deck seemed to be leveled. With this, the morale of the Magus fleet plummeted. Their ships had been torn apart and they had only inflicted very minor damage to the enemy. Some started to flee. Others decided to die for their country. Elven Interception Fleet Damage Report Minor damages to the Garrick and the Sena. We also lost two destroyers. Should we pursue the fleeing enemy? We should be able to outmatch their speed. Admiral Vainery shook his head. Those that flee are cowards and cowards are beneficial to us. Let them spread the word of their defeat. The humans shall tremble before our might.